Okay, we are back with a, another Player's Guide read-through. Um, we will actually be reading through two uh, different documents. This is the original 2008 Curse of the Crimson Throne Player's Guide by James Jacob and Mike McCarter. And there will be a separate forum post we're reading from Paizo as well when they released the um, updated rules and uh, stipulations and all, all of that kind of stuff um, that came out when they did the anniversary edition. So, just kind of uh, jumping into it, we're going to do a straight read-through. Um, again, if I see, you know, anything that sticks out to me as something I want to comment on, um, I will do so probably, especially in the forum post, when we talk about some of the classes, uh, we, will, we will do that. So, yeah, let's uh, jump into it. Starting out here with some um, flavor text from Captain Tevagant Bereskin, uh, Rosen Guard, South Shore Garrison. It says, <clears throat> Not only could I... Not only couldn't I imagine living anywhere else, I simply wouldn't. I'm a good man, a faithful husband, a loving father, and a responsible citizen. What I do has a purpose. And the purpose is to keep Carosa safe. It, not might, it might not be a glamorous job, but it's as important as anything else. So if you're looking for trouble, might I suggest Magnamar or Kermaga. Save yourself some hard labor and be a lot of paperwork if you do. What a cool guy. Welcome to Carosa. <coughs> Sorry, this is Corvosa. Corvosa has long stood as the first bastion of civilization on the wild frontier of Varicia. Yet tragedy seems to haunt the city's royal bloodline. Few of her rulers rule long, and none have lived to see ripe old age, dying instead well before their time. Heirs to the throne are few and far between. In his 300-year history, no king of Corvosa has directly inherited the Crimson Throne from his father. This is a source of much gossip and tail spinning among the city's citizens who speak in hushed tones of what they've come to call the curse of the Crimson Throne. How shall we use this guide? Aside from introducing the curse of the Crimson Throne adventure path, this guide is intended to aid players in the creation of characters native to the city. The information presented herein is common knowledge, especially to all characters who call Corvosa home. This guide is organized to familiarize yourself with the city, a map of Corvosa appears in the inside front cover of this book, while a map of Arisia appears in the inside back cover. Within the following pages, you'll find a gazetta of Corvosa, as well as notes on characters, uh, character races, classes, and equipment as they apply to the city. The last section of the book introduces the background trait concept, um, which we've already seen, obviously, in The Rise of the Ruined Lords, and if you're familiar with Pathfinder Adventure Path, you're, you're well aware of them. This adventure path begins with the assumption that all new characters share one thing in common. They've been wronged in some manner by a local crime lord named Gadrian Lamb. Pick one of the traits that matches your character, and you'll not only get a built-in reason to join forces with the other PCs in your group, but you also get a nice bonus that helps, that'll help you along your way in the ordeals to come. Most of these traits assume that your character spent a significant portion of his childhood in Corvosa, although few of them allow for more widely traveled characters. For the most part, though, Curse of the Crimson Throne works best with PCs who are natives to Corvosa. If this guide whets your appetite for more information about Corvosa, be sure to check out Guide to Corvosa, a 64-page book that explores the daily city in details. If anyone watches this video and then decides I need to read that, let me know. Beyond that, the Pathfinder website paizo.com slash pathfinder and each subsequent volume of Pathfinder will reveal more information about this fantastic city is in the world around it as well as new options for players to get further uh, to further immerse themselves in the ongoing adventure rest assured this guide is merely the first step and your adventures in Gravosa are just beginning
Core bird tongue beaver, Cerulean Society fence. Why do I live here? Why well, live in the most regimented, law abiding, oppressive city this side of the blood sworn veil? Answer simple, mate. With a sable company flapping around in the clouds and hell night stomping on the streets, a gross car caught between them. No one knows who's got jurisdiction over what. You just gotta know when to hide and know when to bribe. You wanna buy this magic dagger or not? You see, we have a host of interesting quotes. You kind of don't see these actually in a lot of uh, the newer player guys, so that's kind of cool. Corvosa. You can see this is the uh, the beggars district where a lot of bad stuff goes down. <clears throat> like the people of any other city, Corvosans concern themselves with more than the day-to-day -day particulars of living with politics history, and macroeconomics. Still, Corvosa has a few particular nuances that make it and its citizens unique. The following overview only begins to touch on what it means to be a Corvosan. At its height, just before the death of Aridin, uh, and if anyone's not terribly familiar, Aridin um, was one of the um, most important gods uh, before this period, uh, in which the Pathfinder game takes place. Uh, he did a lot of stuff, um, including uh, killing Zonk Thuthan, who then rose as a lich later because he killed him. Um, but Aridin, well, we say the death of Aridin, but really he's just missing. Um, he, you know, left into the stars and never came back. So it has been assumed he's dead. Uh, his his priest lost their powers. It was there was a whole thing um, about Aridin going missing, and it ushered in this new age where a lot of divine magic, especially in the realm of um, foretelling and foreseeing the future, uh, just it doesn't doesn't work as well anymore as, as it used to, and uh, a lot of prophecies. Um, surrounding Aridin have suddenly become false. So there's, there's a lot going on there. But at its height, just before the death of Aridin, the departure of the separatist who founded Magnamar, Corvosa topped, just topped 23,000 inhabitants. It lost nearly 10,000 to the resulting chaos of the time, but in the last century it's regained half that. As a result of the rapid contraction and slow re-expansion, Many of the affluent sections of Corvosa remain underpopulated. With the buildings it has and it, the areas it covers, Corvosa could completely fill out to a true metropolis. The dichotomy of Corvosa's underpopulated affluent wards with overcrowded old Corvosa highlights the city's greatest failing. The vast gulf of separation between its wealthy, powerful elites and its dreadfully impoverished poor. The gulf between social classes colors the development of the city and led to the creation of some of the features unique to Corvosa. Those who live in Corvosa respect and admire ostentatious, ostentatious displays of wealth, power, and knowledge. They consider confidence and competence to be of the greatest of assets, and they deride or heckle those who display weakness, indecisiveness, or inability. Corvosans are quick to judge and slow to forgive. In addition to power, Corvosans love predictability. Corvosans like to regulate their lives, creating strict regimens for themselves that they slavishly follow. Upsetting a Corvosan's routine can ruin his entire day and likely makes him angry. Um, this is actually a really good point um, when you're role-playing citizens um, on the half of, of the DM. Or when you're interacting with citizens, you might start to expect this, but I mean, if not, you know, give your DM some uh, forgiveness. We're all um, playing different games. <laughs> to this end, Corvosa strictly enforces its laws, which often have harsh punishments far in excess of the law codes of other non-evil governments, and reward those who play by the rules. That said, Corvosa also recognizes that not everyone plays by the same rules. So it compensates by applying regulations to nonviolent criminals 
in the form of vice taxes and official recognition of the city's single thieves guild. By character amendment, Corvosa does not allow merchants, laborers, or tradesmen to form a guild. Most workers within the city are self-employed or work for a master for whom they apprenticed in their youth. The city relies on these cottage industries and the skilled workers who make them profitable, so it naturally has one entire volume of laws and regulations devoted to the protection and rights of workers. And thanks to the Corvosan drive to succeed, the city's merchants do well for themselves. Here we get a, a nice cool picture of King Irid, or Eildred Erebasti II. Um, not the He's looking too good there. The city of Corvosa wears its Chalexian heritage proudly on every building, tower, and rooftop. As the oldest human settlement in Varicia, a claim recent, uh, frequently challenged by Kermaga, Corvosa considers itself the founding seat of civilization in an otherwise lawless region. Thanks to it and the spread of its people, Varicia has become a relatively safe place to live. Corvosa sits on the end of the Conqueror's Bay, where the Jagar River meets the sea. The city is filled. Uh, the city fills the spit of land formed by two sharp turns in the river, and covers the Indran Isle, which splits the river at its mouth, and spreads to a few outlying areas on the far shore of the Jagar. It stands on two hills, Garrison Hill on Indran Isle and Citadel Hill on the mainland. The narrows of St. Alika separate Indran Isle from the shore. The city is divided into seven districts, many of which are further subdivided into wards. These seven districts are as follows. East Shore, the only district beyond the channel of the Jagar River. East Shore is hand to a home uh, is home to a handful of noble houses, closely tied to the military of the city, as well as the struggling Thumanexus, Thumanexus College? Gray. Well, the Gray District. Unlike all other districts in Gravosa, Gray's residents generally keep to themselves and are well behaved. Of course, most of Gray's residents are dead. The only living creatures who reside in Gray belong to the Church of Phrasma and live within the temple. The Heights. Standing atop Citadel Hill, the Heights District has a commanding view of the rest of the city, which its residents look down on both figuratively and literally. Nearly all of Kravos's power players reside in the Heights, including the monarchy. The Midland. When most people think of Kravosa, they think of the cosmopolitan and friendly district of Midland, as the home district of both the Kravosan Guard and the Sable Company. Midland has the smallest number of gangs and gang battles in the city, although the Thieves Guild does a brisk trade in the districts thanks to the disproportionately high number of merchants, shops, and other commercial and financial concerns. North Point. The first section in the mainland settled by the descendants of the city's Chelish founders was Mainshore. At the northwestern tip of the mainland Corvosa, the ward that houses many of the city's oldest non-noble families. The greater district of North Point covers the entire northern end of the city and holds Corvosa's seat of municipal power, the city hall, and the city's courthouse, Long Acre Building, and the Bank of Abadar. Old Corvosa. As the name implies, Old Corvosa is, well, old. It covers all the Indran Isle, most of which is covered by Garrison Hill. Atop Garrison Hill stands a stone wall of Fort Cavosa, while the imposing black marble palace, Akrona, dominates this northeast corner of the island. South Shore. The newest district, South Shore became a part of Corvosus only a quarter century ago. It contains the pantheon of many, a massive temple dedicated to most of Avastan's most popular deities. South Shore's population consists mainly of the city's Nove rich, hoping to escape the cramped conditions found elsewhere in the city. 
Next we jump to important locations. Five major landmarks give Corvosa a distinctive skyline. The ancient and massive structure of the Castle Corvosa, pillar wall and gatefoot, as well as the more practically sized Great Tower and Hall of Summoning, which has stood for less than 50 years. In addition to these landmarks, several locations unique to the city bear mention. The Academy. Shrouded in secrecy, the campus's 30-foot high walls only barely conceal the Grand Hall of Summoning. Visitors and residents cannot hope to ignore the presence of the Academy, since very few, and since very few people unconnected with the college know what happens within it. The birthplace, the place births abundant and sometimes ludicrous rumors. Castle Corvosa. The centerpiece of the city. Castle Corvosa towers over the heights. Multiple Lord Magistrates, Seneschals, and Monarchs have added to the castle over the th past three centuries. As such, despite a relatively consistent neo shalaxian styling, the castle's main tower and interior building are crammed together haphazardly. The Shingles. Permanent and semi-permanent homes, roads, and safe houses appear on the roof throughout most of the crowded parts of the city. These rooftop communities and pathways that connect them are collectively known as the Shingles. The Volts. Most cities have sewers. Some can even have dungeons beneath them. Yet few have as complex a system of subterranean tunnels, quite like the Volts of Corvosa. Modern Corvosa stands atop the remains of at least two other civilizations and integrates both of them into its design. Military The Protectors of Corvosa Three military pol uh, group police and protect Corvosa. The Corvosan Guard, the Order of the Nail Hell, Lights, Hell Knights, and the Sable Company. Each one focuses its efforts on different areas and interacts with the monarchy in its own unique way. The Kravosan card serves the city as Kravosa's first, the government's second, and the Church of Abadar third. It works closely with the city leaders and the high priest of Abadar to maintain order in the city, acting most often like a police force, but turning into a military organization whenever the city is threatened by external forces. The Sable Company does not answer to the King of Corvosa, but rather to the Seneschal of Castle Corvosa. These hippogriff riding marines defend the skies and waters of Corvosa, and provide aerial and amphibious support to the Corvosan Guard operations. Hell Knights are fanatics of law, adhering only to the harsh Chalexian born vision of order and their own unyielding sense of honor. Like most Hell Knights, those of the Order of Nail believe themselves to be above morality caring only for the establishment of righteous order at all cost. The Underground The Cerulean Society is Gorosa's thief guild, and its monitors, controls, or influences almost all illegal activities of any noticeable size in the city. More than a dozen gangs work the streets, vaults, and shingles of Corvosa, but most of them answer in some way to the Cerulean Society, or else do not survive long. Hastily hushed rumors put one of the noble houses, the de facto leadership behind the Thieves' Guild. Corvosan's history, conflict, misery, and division define the history of Corvosa. Founded as an island fortress at the edge of a hostile and untamed land, Corvosa evolved over time into a bustling and energetic trade center. Several distinct periods define the history of Corvosa, from its blood-splattered founding to its current turmoil. Before the city's founding, the site on which Corvosa stands was, a sacred, was sacred to the Shirati, although most have forgotten why. They knew only that a large pyramid atop the hill at the mouth of the river was to be guarded at all cost, and no one was ever to enter it. For hundreds of years, they kept this promise. In 4407 AR, Field Marshal Jack Theon Corvosa rescued an abandoned group of Chilean Marines trapped on a hostile island and founded Fort Corvosa. 
the settlement acted as a strong defensive position and trading post for settlers, pioneers, trappers, and explorers in the area. After much of the settlement burned during a Shawanti raid, an event known as the Great Fire, an influx of Chelish gold and tradesmen strengthened the settlement's defenses and allows its residents to move onto the mainland. An ill-fated insult against a very prominent Corosa noble family sparked the Cousin War in 50, uh, 4502 AR. The war ended Corosa's role as a military outpost, and with a further influx of Chelish nobility, made the settlement into a true colony. A period of great wealth followed, leading to a steady increase in size. Corvosa's prosperity came crashing down in 4606 AR, when the unexpected death, or as we said before, missing, Aradin, kicked off a civil war in Imperial Chelix. Cut off from its homeland without a word, Corvosa survived these dark times. Today the city prospers again, and thanks to, or in some cases despite of, its self-appointed royalty. The people of Corvosa. Buildings, infrastructure, and politics make the city livable, or intolerable in some cases, but the people who live in the place truly make it a city. Barely more powerful than the Lord Magistrates who preceded them, the monarchs of Corvosa must share power with the strict governmental entities existent at the founding of the monarchy. The command King Erodrid II exerts over the city is constantly checked by the arbiters, magisters, magistrates, sorry, and nobles. The city is the most politically powerful group. More than judges, the arbiters not only determine the guilt or innocent of defendants in a court of law, but also have legislative oversight. No one knows exactly what the 23 magistrates or their staff do, but most Corosans suspect the entire purpose of the city hall is to waste time and money of the city's people. Finally, two overlapping divisions define Corvosa's aristocracy. The five most powerful families bear the coveted title of Great Houses. Giving their, members special, giving their members special privileges within the city. And 21 noble houses make up the dock families, allowing them to charge birthing fees on one or more docks in the city. Uh, we will read over real quick just these two um, feats here. I don't actually know that uh, these are available still in the game, or if these were phased out when they did the rethink. Um, but we'll look at it, uh, because I'm pretty sure the Sable Company Marine um, Ranger, I don't know if you can still take that, but I know you can take uh, an archetype for Ranger that allows you to do something similar, so I'm not sure. But Sable Company Marine, you graduated from the elite hippogriff riding school of the Indran Military Academy. Not only can you ride a hippogriff with great skill, but you may also bond with one. You must be a Ranger, fourth level, the benefit you gain a hippogriff as your animal companion. You gain a plus two bonus of ride checks while riding your hippogriff animal companion. And whenever you're within 20 feet, you get a plus two on save, uh, will saves against fear effects. Uh, yeah, I think they must have changed some of that because that doesn't. The way it even puts it, plus two on saving throws made against fear effects. You're never going to make any type of save against fear effects except a saving throw, I would imagine. Uh, I don't know, maybe you can make a 42 save. New feet shingle runner. As a child, you spent a lot of time in the shingles. The, inter the interconnected rooftops that span much of Gravosa, you're particularly adept at climbing, jumping, and avoiding falls. It requires a dexterity of 13 and acrobatic feet. You get a plus two bonus on climb and jumps checks, and you may take 10 on a climb check even when distracted. If you fail, if you fall, you automatically reduce the damage taken by half by, you reduce it by one die as if you had fallen 10 less feet. Reduction list damage stacks with the jump and tumble checks to further reduce falling damage. So that's... I, like I said, I have no idea if those are still anything, but there they are. Notable Corvosans. Listed here are many of Corvosans' most well-known names, and be they famous or infamous. Uh, here we get a picture of Magistrate Garrick Tan. Oh, what a fine and dandy looking fellow. 
the government. The government is split into three groups. The arbiter service judges, trying criminal cases and sending civil disputes. The magistrates handle the day-to-day -day bureaucracy of the city management. And the monarchy serves as Corvosa's diplomats and defenders. Cressida Croft, the current leader of, Corvosa's, of the Corvosan Guard, Field Marshal Cressida Croft is an even-tempered woman who practices an openly uh, encouraging adventurers and mercenaries to aid the Guard in the city's defense has earned her some unfair criticism by the city's elite. Eodred Arabasti II. The King of Corvosa is a man whose spendthrift's ways are moderated somewhat by the numerous good works he has spearheaded. We don't go into a lot of detail about that, I guess. Iliosa Arabasti, Queen of Corvosa. Iliosa is barely a third the age of her husband. Rumor says she holds much of the Corvosa in attempt, in contempt, and she seduced the king into marrying her simply to advance her own wealth and riches. Garrick Tan, the aforementioned pretty boy below. Often called the most hated man in Corvosa, Garrick Tan is the magistrate of commerce, a man who oversees the collection of taxes in the city. Yep, that won't make you very popular. Lolia Perin, or Lolia Perini, I'm not sure which one. Once the priest of Abadar, the current magistrate of regulation, is tasked with the maintenance of weights and measures. Much of her office time is spent seeking out faulty scales, shaved coins, and other attempts by merchants and, cu and customers to cheat one another. Marcus Thalissinus Indrin. Commandant Indrin is the current leader of the Sable Company. A man whose dedication to tradition and honor sometimes blind him to what might be the best for his own career. Neo Landis Kali Papa Let me try that again. Neo Landis Kali Papalis. Kali Papalis. Yeah, that sounds right. Neo Landis Kali Papalis. Mouthful. The Seneschal of Castle Corvosa. Neo Landis Kali Papalis. Populus commands the defenses of the castle itself, and is regarded as the second most powerful individual in the city, behind only King Eodred II. Severs Boneclaw Debris, the intimidating and mysterious commander of the Order of the Nail. Lictor Debris is a towering man who rarely leaves his post at Citadel of Raid. Seal Gar. If Garrick Tan is one of Corvosa's most hated officials, Magistrate of Expenditures Silgar is one of the most loved. His responsibility is to see yeah, it that yeah. the ta city taxes are spent properly and efficiently on public works. Yeah, and lastly, Zenobia Zenderholm, known as the Hanging Judge, Zenobia is Corvosa's senior arbiter. Her reputation is justifiably fearsome among Corvosa's criminals. Citizens of note. Now that we've come over this government, let's look at the citizens. From a lofty purchase of the city's aristocracy down to the market entertainers, merchants, and criminals, many of Corvosa's citizens are well-known figures. Here we see arc banker Darb Tuttle. I assume we'll talk about him in a minute. Blackjack. One of the city's most beloved and reviled heroes. Blackjack is more of a symbol than anything else. A legendary masked hero who has fought for Kovosis downtrodden for hundreds of years. Bool. The guildmaster of Cerulean society. Corvosa's thief guild. Bool is feared by many and respected by few. Darb Tuttle, the man above. The Ark Banker of the Church of Erodar. Darb Tuttle is one of most uh, one of Corvosa's most powerful clerics. See, that's really interesting. I never knew that um, the Church of uh, Abadar would, instead of having like an Ark Bishop, they have an Ark Banker. I think that's kind of funny. Cool.
Devorgo Barvasi. Known to some as the King of Spiders, Devargo runs Ill's End, a collection of ships that double as a brothel, drug den, and gambling hall. Glorio Arcona. The patriarch of one of Corvosa's most powerful noble families, it's rumored Glorio has ties to most, if not all, of Corvosa's criminal underworld. Capira de Bear. The bishop of the cathedral of Ferasma, Capira's stewardship over the city's gray district has kept the presence of undead at an all-time low. Piltz Swestel. Piltz owns and runs Old Corvosa's exemplary excurables, a playhouse that caters to those seeking perverse and morally questionable entertainment. Morally, morally questionable entertainment. Sabina Marin. Many rumors surround Queen Iliosa's bodyguard, not the least of which is that she and the Queen are secretly lovers, yet none can deny this imposing woman's loyalty to the crown. Yeah. Toph Ornelos. The Academy is the most prestigious school of magic in Varicia, and its headmaster, Toph, is one of the region's most respected and powerful wizards. Vincarlo Orosini, owner of the renowned Orosini Academy Fighting School. Vincaro's outspoken disdain for Corvosa's government has earned him trouble on several occasions. Um, we get a quick little note here. These are actually really good. I forget these and look back at them all the time whenever I play uh, for the sake of, like, in-game, um, keeping, your, keeping your players or, as a player, um, trying to stay in, in the... Um, fantasy mindset. Oh, so we look here at the Galorian calendar. Time travels on Galorian much as it dear on our, uh, much as it does here on our own Earth. Sixty seconds for a minute, sixty minutes for an hour, twenty-four hours make a day. The people of Galorian measure time much as we do: seven days to a week, twelve, thirty days, months to a year. Years are marked as the founding of the last great empire by Aradin, the last man. Although the Empire has collapsed, its calendar remains in use today. At the start of the Curse of the Crimson Throne, the date is 4708 AR. AR meaning Absalom Reckoning. The days of the week are as follows. Each day has a general purpose that most people in the Inner Sea region follow. Moon Day, um, which is much like our Monday, um, is for work and r religious gatherings at night. Um, because, you know, moon day. Toil day, obviously for work. Wheel day, for work. Oath day. Oath day is for work. The signing of packs and the swearing of oaths, unsurprisingly. Fire day is for work. Star day is for work. And Sunday, um, which actually lines up with Sunday, is for rest and for religion. Um, so, Pathfinder Sabbath. Months. The months in Glorian correspond to our own as well, with each new year setting, starting shortly after the solstice. Each month is etymologically tied to a specific god. Residents of Glorian see the gods reflected in the changing seasons, and their names for the months were reflected in this. Abadius, which is Abadar, Calistril, Calistra, Verast, Vermarch, Verasma, Gosrin for April, for Gosre, Desnus for May, for Desna, uh, Serenith for June, for Serenre, Erastus for July, for Aristil, Eridus for August, for Eridan, Rova for September, uh, for Rovagug, Lamashin, October for Lamashtu, Neth, November for Nethus, and Cuthona uh, for December. Who is Cuthona? I'm not sure who Cuthona would... I'm sure I'm going to feel dumb whenever I think about it for a second. 